Camera just made a very weird sound. Don't love that. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime. Crew Trime. If you're new here, hello. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup at the same time. So if that sounds like fun to you, you're in the right place. So make sure you subscribe to this channel, hit the bell notification, and then that way you will never miss one of my terrible stories. You guys, we have finally done it. This story is taking us to the 50th state. So we have officially told a terrible story in all 50 states. Can you believe it? So this state is the birthplace of toilet paper. Oh yeah, you're welcome. It's also the home of the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere and the United States' most populous city that I just so happen to live in. It's the concrete jungle where dreams are made of. It's New York City, baby. Well, actually it's not, it's not New York City. It's just New York. And this is the story of Eric Smith. So, you know, every so often in crew crime land or, you know, true crime land, uh, sometimes we're telling similar stories or we tell the same one and that one has just happened. So <laughs> coincidence, man. So a couple of things before I get started, I don't really talk about the makeup that I'm using as I'm using it, but if you're interested to know, just look down in the description box because everything is linked. You just have to click the link to go see what it is. Let's get started. Oh, one more disclaimer. I know last week's story was about children, so I made sure to tell you about it. This one is also about children, but it's about a child as well. Double whammy. On August 2nd, 1993 in Savona, New York, the almost five-year-old Derek Roby was about to head out the door to summer camp. And I say almost five years old because he was like two months shy of his fifth birthday, but he was closer to five than he was to four. You know what I'm saying. So every day for the past like three weeks, Derek's mom, Doreen, who went by Dory, she had walked him the short distance to the park and rec center where the summer camp was held. So Derek also had a baby brother named Dalton who was about a year and a half old. And um, that morning he was extra fussy, you know, teething and all that stuff. So Dory was trying to deal with him and get Derek to camp on time. So Derek just asked if it would be okay if he could just walk by himself. Now I know what you're saying, five years old, absolutely not. But you know what? I remember I walked my little five-year-old self to kindergarten like almost a mile. Anyways, so Derek Joseph Roby was born on October 2nd, 1988 in Savona, New York to Doreen, Dory, and Dale Roby. Dory and Dale were high school sweethearts that married in 1986. Dale was actually born and raised in Savona and the Roby family had roots in that area since like the 1800s. Dory was a stay-at-home mom and Dale worked as a typesetter. Very interesting. So Derek was described as like a fearless, energetic little boy, and he loved fishing and all sports, but especially baseball. He had blonde hair, blue eyes, and a cheeky grin. So that summer, he had been attending daily summer camp at Concer Memorial Park that was just at the end of the street that they lived on, like just a couple blocks. And as I mentioned, most mornings, Dory and baby Dalton would walk Derek down to the park, but sometimes Dory would just sort of stand out front on the sidewalk and just watch him walk his way down. Their street, McCoy Street, actually ended at the rec center. It was a like a dead end street and the rec center was just a couple blocks down. He didn't even need to cross the road to get there. Also, there was at that time a bunch of kids out, you know, making their way down to the rec center also. So Dory handed Derek his little lunch bag and he scooted out the door just after 9 a.m. I haven't really mentioned this town, Savona, New York, it's upstate. It's small, really small, like the population's under a thousand. So the weather forecast actually wasn't looking great that day. You know, clouds and rain were starting to roll in and the camp was likely gonna be closed. So at around 10:15, it's actually started pouring down rain. So Dory grabbed little Dalton and jumped in the car to drive down to the rec center to pick up Derek. When she got there, Dory didn't see him right away. So she approached one of the counselors, Erica. She was a 17 year old volunteer. And Erica told her that Derek hadn't shown up that day. Dory was panicked. She frantically got home and called her husband Dale at work and then the police. So within the hour, the streets were filled with kids, you know, on bikes, searching the area 
area. Volunteer firefighters were out there using a bullhorn to try to call for Derek. And people from the community were going door to door, including a 13-year-old boy named Eric Smith and his stepdad, Ted. By 3 p.m., state troopers had arrived to assist with the search. As I mentioned, the population of Savona was very small. Um, in 1993, the entire town was made up of 974 people, and it seemed like all of them were out searching for Derek. At 3.45 p.m., lead investigator Charles Woods from the New York State Police found Derek's body in a wooded area just off of McCoy Street, mere blocks from their house. Derek had suffered some major damage trauma to his face and head and his pants and underwear had been pulled down and a long stick had been inserted in his butthole. He was lying face up on top of a small rock pile and his body looked like it had been posed. His hands were like up near his head and his shoes had been removed and like placed next to his hands. Really weird. They also found his lunch bag nearby. All of the contents were strewn about. The banana that had been inside was smashed and the red Kool-Aid that was inside had been poured all over his face. The bologna sandwich that had been inside was gone along with the homemade peanut butter cookies and the paper towel that was inside the bag had been stuffed into his mouth. When Derek's body was autopsied, they found that he had severe head injuries, including multiple skull fractures, extensive tearing and bleeding of tissues in his chest. His intestinal wall had been perforated, you know, probably from that stick. And he also had a couple of other pinpoint hemorrhages on his neck, face, and eyes. The cause of death was ruled to be blunt force trauma to the head with contributing asphyxia. Manner of death, obviously, homicide. So the New York State Police actually took lead on the case because Savona didn't really have a proper police force. So the investigation began with interviews. You know, they started with the 60 plus kids from the camp. The criminal profiler on the case that examined Derek's body and the area said that that killer must have been an older pedophile, possibly a sex crime parolee. Maybe a stranger to the area, some kind of drifter, or because they weren't noticed, a local. Well, well, they searched the police records for potential suspects. The one thing that everyone agreed on was that this was terrifying and the townspeople started like locking their doors that day. So while they were doing these interviews, they encountered this boy that I mentioned before, this 13 year old named Eric Smith. Eric had been at the camp that morning and he seemed very helpful, you know, so much so that he would stop by the police department even after his interview wanting to help. He said that he actually saw Derek that day. Whoa. He even reenacted this encounter with the boy, you know? He took the police into the street with his bicycle and kind of showed him at a distance, sort of like where he saw him, how far he, away he was, stuff like that. Okay, why don't you go up here and you start? Investigator Wood was there. And as you can see from this police videotape, Eric looks calm as can be. During the reenactment, I would have to say he enjoyed it. He was having a good time. But as he went on with his version of events, it wasn't really adding up. From the very beginning of their encounters with Eric, the police felt that he knew more than what he was saying, you know? And specifically, they believed that maybe he had seen something that he was either too afraid to talk about, or maybe he'd been threatened. During one of the interview sessions, Eric actually got really upset and said, you think I did it, don't you? That's a weird thing to say, kid. You know what I'm saying? Well, you know what's even weirder was on the night that Derek's body was found, Eric asked a family friend what would happen if the killer turned out to be a kid. <laughs> what? Okay, so Eric's mother tried really hard to get him to talk, to open up a little bit more. You know, they knew that he had been close by on the day of the murder, so, you know, maybe the police were right. He'd seen something or you know, had been threatened. They didn't really get anywhere, but two days after that bicycle reenactment with the police, Eric came clean. He told his mother, Tammy, I did it. I'm sorry, I snapped and I'd done it. I killed that little boy. <laughs> what? So who was Eric Smith? 
I'm glad you asked. Eric Smith was born on January 22nd, 1980 in Savona, New York to Tammy and Randy Hefner. Eric also had an older sister named Stacy who at this time was 15 and also had a stepsister named Holly who was 12. Well, Tammy and Randy Hefner had been high school sweethearts who got married in 1978. They were very young when they married and Randy was barely 18 and Tammy was a year younger than him. So, you know, a child. So Stacy was actually born shortly after they were married. Probably the reason they got married, you know what I'm saying? And uh, surprise, surprise, it didn't work out. You know, they fought a lot. They broke up and got back together many, many times. And the last time that they got back together was when Tammy became pregnant with Eric. But they divorced like pretty shortly after that even before he was born. Actually, while Tammy was still pregnant with Eric, she remarried a local man named Ted Smith. So Eric's father, Randy, didn't believe that Eric was his son, so he gave permission to Ted to adopt Eric. It's like a whole side story, I'm just gonna leave it alone. But it does explain why Eric's last name is Smith and not Hefner. Well, Ted was a mechanic and Tammy was a stay-at-home mom who was active in the community, you know, more specifically softball. She was president of the softball league and Ted was a coach and both of the daughters played. It seems like softball is like the, the entire purpose of this town. Everybody was playing baseball, softball. So Eric actually had issues from the start, even before he was born. He was developmentally delayed. He didn't start walking and talking until he was like two. You know, I'm not a mom, so I don't know things about kids. Like, is that normal? Apparently not. He also had some pretty major behavioral issues, specifically anger. His pediatrician noted that he threw temper tantrums almost daily. And I'm talking like knock down, drag out, kick and scream in, holding breath tantrums. Hello, you two. He would also like bang his own head against the ground. Very dramatic. Eric's teachers at school also noticed that he had severe learning issues, problems with concentration and cognition, the whole thing. It was just bad. He was held back in kindergarten and then again in the fourth grade. So by age 13, he was a fifth grader. Well, on top of all of these issues, he was also bullied relentlessly for his appearance. I mean, I'm a ginger, so I understand being teased, but this was like next level. The kid looked like Alfred E. Newman, but like off-brand. <laughs> it's true, look at him. I mean, as a fellow ginger, I kind of feel bad for him. Anyways, so like I said, school was rough. He had a lot of behavior problems, but like the red flags are just starting, friends. What kind of red flags, you ask? Eric Smith was displaying all three signs of the McDonald triad. It's also known as like the homicide triad or the psychopath triad. So what, what it is, is there's three factors and all you need is two of the three. And if you have three of the three, it's no good. They're predictive of violent tendencies. So studies have shown in many, many violent people, serial killers types, people like that, have displayed at least two, if not all three of these behaviors. And the behaviors are bedwetting past the age of five, Eric was wetting the bed well past age 11. Obsession with fires. This kid was setting fires at a really young age. And animal abuse. Check. So remember, it's a really small town, small community. Everybody sort of knows everybody. And many people in the community viewed him as a sweet child. You know, he was known to volunteer to help neighbors by offering to mow their lawn, carry their groceries, take out their trash. However, his next door neighbor, Arthur, once caught Eric with his cat, having suffocated the cat using a radiator hose around its neck. They also knew that he would torture birds, mice, and rabbits, and he would run over cats with his four-wheeler. Neighbor Arthur said that he accepted Eric's apology about the cat and let him do yard work to like work it off. But he also said that he saw Ted, um, Eric's stepdad, getting, well, adopted dad, getting like physical with him, like real rough. 
and he felt sorry for him. So Eric was also very close with his grandparents, Red and Edie Wilson, and he spent a lot of time with them, you know? They described him as a sweet boy who loved hugs and was very affectionate, and he loved to make people laugh. He was like a little clown. I mean, yeah, he was. Look at that hair. <laughs> Well, some people in the town whose children he was friends with said that he was always looking for an excuse to sleep over. You know, it seemed like Eric found every opportunity he could to sleep away from his home and everybody knew it. Okay, well, back to Eric's confession. So Eric's great-grandfather, Carl Peters, contacted investigators and told them that Eric had confessed. So he wanted to bring Eric in, but he specifically didn't want the state police involved in like some kind of interrogation or anything like that. Instead, he asked for the district attorney to be present and he wanted to avoid like a public arrest and grand jury proceedings, all of that. He said that he wanted to handle the matter as peacefully and quiet as possible because, quote, our boy needs help. But at no time did he believe that Eric would be tried as an adult. You know, he thought he'd get tried in family court and given a chance for some kind of therapy, rehabilitation, something like that. When they arrived, the district attorney agreed, yes, Eric needs help so that, you know, they should get some psychological evaluations done and all that. But he never made any kind of promises. And in the state of New York, if a juvenile is charged with any kind of murder, the DA is the one who gets to decide which court it's gonna go to. For the next four hours, Eric sat with the DA and gave a very detailed description of what happened on August 2nd. He said that he was already kind of in a bad mood that morning. You know, he didn't really want to go to camp, but then he did go to camp, and then when he got there, he was just like being a nuisance, whatever. Also, it wasn't really open quite yet, I guess. So he was more irritated than he really should have been in that kind of scenario speaks to his anger problems, whatever. He sped away on his bicycle and he saw Derek walking alone. And he said as soon as he saw him, he wanted to hurt him. He also clarified that he'd never actually met Derek before and Derek didn't do anything or say anything to draw any kind of attention. He kind of waited for the other kids to, you know, not be so nearby. And then he approached Derek and asked him if he wanted to take a shortcut through the woods to get to the rec center before everyone else. Well, Derek said he wasn't supposed to go in that area and Eric assured him that he'd be right there with him. So he got off his bike and he and Derek went into the woods. Once they were off the street, immediately in the woods, Eric strangled Derek with his hands until he passed out. And then he found a large rock that he had to partially like dig out of the ground. And he started hitting Derek in the head with it over and over. Then he found an even larger rock that he estimated weighed about 20 pounds, pretty heavy, right? And he dropped it on top of Derek from above multiple times. Then he dumped out Derek's lunch bag, stuffed the towel, the paper towel in his mouth, smashed the banana, and then he got out that red Kool-Aid and poured it all over Derek's face where he was, you know, cut and bleeding. He then pulled down Derek's pants and unawares, and he broke a stick off from a nearby tree and shoved it, you know, where he did. Years later, Eric would eventually explain about the stick in the... He said that it wasn't meant to be like a sexual violation. He was trying to reach Derek's heart. Just wild to think about. He said he tried to stab the stick through his chest and through his eye, but it just wasn't sharp enough. Well, after he was done, he rode away on his bicycle. You know, he said he rode around and then actually came back to see if the body was still there because when he left, he didn't know if Derek was actually dead or not, and he was worried that if he got up, he would tell on him. And he hadn't planned to kill him, but he did plan to hurt him. Well, Eric Smith, 13 years old, was arrested and charged with second degree murder and was tried as an adult. Gasp. Eric's attorneys pled not guilty by, you know, reason of mental disease or defect, and they hired a forensic psychologist and a psychiatrist to evaluate him and to testify at trial. They made a motion to exclude his confession, saying that he didn't understand what was going on, he didn't understand the Miranda warning, and he couldn't understand the gravity of the situation. 
The judge denied all those motions. The trial eventually did begin exactly one year to the day of the murder. Well, the defense team went on about how when Tammy was pregnant with Eric, a medication that she took to control her epilepsy caused developmental delays and that Eric suffered from intermittent explosive disorder or IED. People who have this disorder describe feeling as if they're about to explode. After the, the episodic rage, the child may appear to be, quote, normal. So children and adults with IED have repeated sudden episodes of impulsive, aggressive, violent behavior or like angry verbal outbursts where they react grossly out of proportion to the situation. So the medication that they're talking about is called trimethodione. It's known to cause birth defects, but has never been linked directly to IED. The state also pointed out that Tammy was taking that medication when she had her other pregnancies, but no one else had the issues. Okay, so as for this diagnosis, this IED condition, well, the state thought that was a bunch of bullshit. In fact, another psychiatrist testified that Eric showed purposeful behavior by a boy who was comfortable and excited by aggression. They said that he made rational choices like moving the body to try to hide it. He, there was also some details in his recollection of the murder that somebody in a blind rage would not have remembered. Further, Eric also relayed to them that on the night of the murder, he, quote, slept like a baby. The defense stated that Eric appeared normal following the murder, and it just shows that he's not normal. The point was that Eric Smith had been so badly bullied and abused that he wanted to bully and abuse someone else, and he enjoyed it. Oh, by the way, his dad, Ted, it came out at trial that uh, Ted was molesting Eric's older sister. He molested me. I'd want to know if he was molested. There had to been something bothering him. It was thought that, you know, Ted must have been molesting Eric as well, which would explain the bedwetting. It's often a signal of that. Not always, but... Well, Eric denied any sexual abuse, although he did say that there was definitely emotional and psychological abuse in the home. So at the end of the trial, the jury did find Eric Smith guilty of second degree murder. When a juror spoke out later, she said that uh, it was the testimony of two witnesses that really changed things for her or for the jury. There were two eight-year-olds that had testified. Um, they each said that at separate times that morning, Eric tried to get them to go with him to the woods. And you can imagine after those kids provided that testimony, they left the stand crying and shaking and the jury found them to be very believable. At the sentencing phase, the defense asked for five years to life so that Eric could avoid going to adult prison. On November 27th, 1994, Eric Smith was sentenced to the maximum juvenile sentence at the time, nine years to life in prison. What this means is that after completing nine years, he would be eligible for parole. The sentence also specified that he would be housed in a juvenile prison until he was old enough to go to the adult one. So after his 21st birthday, he was actually transferred to the Clinton Correctional Facility in Danmore, New York. Very shortly after Eric arrived to adult prison, he was attacked brutally and beaten severely, which caused the prison to move him to a special cell block where prisoners with disabilities are housed. So after Eric completed that first nine years, he became eligible for parole in 2002, which was denied, as were the next 10 hearings. My anger wasn't directed at Derek at all. It was directed at all the other guys who used to pick on me. And when I was torturing and killing Derek, that was what I saw in my head. These hearings happen every two years, and every two years, the Roby family would write letters and in some instances testify in front of the parole board to plead with them to deny it. They said that they just were not able to get closure after Derek's death, and every two years they had to relive this entire nightmare. Well, in these hearings, the parole board would interview Eric, and they weren't liking what he was saying most of the time. He was asked once if he was released, would he kill again, and he said, yeah. They asked, why did you do it? And he said, well, instead of being hurt, I was hurting somebody else. He also explained that his father, Ted, was very abusive, but you know, 
Anyways, after his 11th parole hearing in October 2021, and after serving 27 years in prison, 41-year-old Eric was granted parole. The parole board pointed to the fact that after 27 years in prison, his disciplinary record was pretty clean. You know, he'd only had three write-ups the entire time he was in prison. His risk assessment score was low. He had completed a bunch of programs. He had a very strong release plan and he was sincerely remorseful. Smith at 13 is not the same person that he is at 31 or at 41. He has changed, we all changed. And you kind of go, what else can he do to prove that he is no longer a danger to society? Now we're at the point where it becomes, is this about punishment or about rehabilitation? So after some delays and some protests in Savona, they didn't want him coming back there. Eric was quietly released from prison on February 1st, 2022, and he now lives in Queens, New York. He's serving lifetime parole. Over the years, the Roby family actually helped get two laws passed in the state of New York. The first one changed the number of years between parole hearings for class A felonies from every two years to every five years. The second was when Dory signed on to help support Penny's law and testified in front of Congress and the law did pass, which what that did was uh, specific to juveniles that are convicted of second degree murder. It raised the minimum sentence from seven and a half years to life and the maximum to 15 years to life. The Roby and Smith families actually still live in Savona, New York. The land where Derek was killed was later cleared and a new community park with two new baseball fields were built. And in 1994, a bronze statue of a baseball playing Derek was dedicated and placed in the park. And the plaque on it reads, dedicated to be a gentle reminder of what childhood is supposed to be. And that is the story of Eric Smith. <coughs> Again, if you want to know any of the makeup that I used in today's video, just check down in the description box. If it is available, I will link it. If it's not, I will link something similar. And that is the 50th story covering the 50th state. So where are we going to go now? So I think I'm going to do some case updates, maybe some cases that are a little bit more current in the news. And don't forget about recommendations. I would love to hear from you. So if you have a terrible story that you would like me to cover, just look down in the description box. There's a Google doc that you can come complete with all the information I want to know about it. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then make sure you subscribe to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on all the other socials. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! Trimethadone? Methadione? God, this makeup looks fucking terrible today. Is that straight? I can't tell. Pinpoint hemorrhages, hem hemorrhages. Specifically didn't, he said that he, he, <laughs> so after issues with <laughs> fucking shit. That's a weird sound. What the fuck sound was that?